What is up guys, Taiki here, or welcome to episode 11 of the Crypto Market Wizards podcast. Today, I have here with me Chow from Alliance. Dao, how are you doing today? Great to be here, Taiki. Um, really excited to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you don't need an intro, but do you mind for our audience just sharing how you got into crypto and what you do now? I'm a founder support for Alliance Founders uh, for the last three years. Uh, I spent almost all my time helping our founders uh, to get to product market fit. Uh, most of our founders are first time uh, evergreen f- founders. And for me, th- the greatest feeling in the world is to believe in a founder before they even believe in themselves and um, help them and turn them into monsters. And, and that's, I-, I felt like I've I found um, my-, my-, my life's work uh, at Alliance. And I just got a lot of energy from doing that. Um, before Alliance, I was the founder had a product in Masari. And uh, I mean, everyone knows Masari is doing really well. Um, and before Masari spent uh, many years in, in TradFi. So I used to be a TradFi bro. Nice, nice. Uh, you kind of sound like a parent there. You know, you're trying to take these young 20 year old kids and they lack the self confidence, but you're going to like try to convince them into monsters. Uh, is that kind of how you view it? Like just trying to groom these people into just be killers? It, in a way, yes. But I also. I learn. I actually learn more from them than they learn from me. Um, so I, I, sometimes I feel like a parent, but other time, most of the time, I feel like a student. Um, and I get to see both success stories and failures about fifty to a hundred times per year. So I learn a lot from them. Yeah, I think growth mindset is very important to have in crypto. Um, the space is changing constantly. Uh, there's new narratives all the time, new sectors. Um, and I guess to demonstrate, uh, my growth mindset, uh, I do want to ask for your advice because, uh, this is like going to be my second cycle. It seems like the Bitcoin ETF that's been a good, uh, market it's the spirits pretty high. Um, but I don't want to be a mid curve. Right. And then sat start shared this hilarious tweet, uh, and you kind of quoted, tweeted it where, you know, a second cycle, you have so much PTSD that you do dumb things like sell the news. It's first in speculation is bad. And then third cycle, you come full circle. And finally, appreciate Bonk and you know Dog with Hat. Uh, can, can you kind of explain like your interpretation of this bell curve meme with like first cycle, yeah. second cycle, third cycle? Yeah. So first cycle, you know nothing, and you take a lot of risk. A lot of people take a lot of risk, and uh, they hit big um, until the bear market hits. Uh, they lose seventy to eighty percent of their investments. Um, but that's still better. It's still better than than being a no coiner. But the problem is, once you've, learned, once you've lost 80% of your uh, investments, you just get so much PTSD. And then the second, the second cycle comes in. What happens a lot is you just paper hand too early. So uh, this ETF thing is actually a great example of it because a lot of people are like, you know, sell the news, it's priced in, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I have, I have no strong opinion on that. I, I don't actually know if it's sell the news or buy the news. I don't know if it's priced in or not. But I do think that we're still in the early innings of this bull cycle. And if you're going to sell the news off of this uh, ETF thing, you're might gonna, you might be able to capture maybe 20, 30% of the move. But then the upside is like 3 to 5x on the majors and way more on the alts, right? So you're trying to you know, catch a 20% move off of a 10, 10x, move, uh, 10x upside. It, it, it's, if you're wrong, I mean, the, the downside is, is, is too big, right? So I, I just don't see why you would want to do that. And, and that's what I mean by mid-curving in the second cycle is, is paper, paper heading too early. Um, now, the third cycle comes in. Uh, you've learned all your lessons from the past two cycles. And for me personally, I, you know, this is my fourth cycle probably. And um, this is the first time I, I really start to appreciate meme, meme coins uh, like Bonk and, and Whiff. And I just, you know, a lot of people actually are skeptical about, like I, I tweet about Whiff quite a bit. I don't, I don't say you should, you should buy Whiff on, on Twitter, but I do tweet a lot about it. And sometimes people are angry that I'm, you know, that I talk positively about meme coins. Um, I suspect they're second cyclers. By the way. <laughs> Um, but, um, but once you, you're in your third, third cycle, um, you really start to realize that, um, 
the price and the valuation and the FDV of a lot of these tokens are really driven by memes, right? Like Bitcoin is the, is the epitome of it, right? The, the meme behind Bitcoin is digital gold. It has no revenue. Why, why, why should it command a trillion dollar FDV, right? And you're, yeah, you're pulling up this tweet, but, but ETH is the same thing, right? ETH, the meme behind ETH is, uh, I guess, uh, um, a programmable blockchain, a tech play. Of course, ever since, uh, you know, the, the last two upgrades, ETH now has a yield. So you can say, okay, ETH now maybe has a yield, has cash flow, blah, blah, blah. It's no longer a meme coin. But before, before that, for the first like six to seven years, ETH was also a meme coin. Same thing you can say about Sol and you know Cardano and, and stocks. Everything, everything is a meme for me in, in crypto. By the way, I'm I'm not saying that's that's the right way to look at things, but I think it's a helpful perspective. If you view things through that lens, um, a lot of things, a lot of valuation in crypto will make sense to you. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I think with crypto, there's no value. I mean, you can try to do P ratios or like growth metrics, but no one really knows what the fuck they're doing, right? Like, to, to be frank. Um, and at the end of the day, there's a limited amount of capital in, like, the trading community. And people just want to make money. So trading in crypto is kind of like trading attention, right? It's like, if you can kind of think ahead of, like, okay, people care about this now, but what will, what will people care about in, let's say, two months? And then you kind of position, position yourself for that. Um, and if you think that people will care about fast and cheap chains, then, yeah, like, maybe Solana, say, right? That's where people go. And it's like, then like, if people want beta to Solana, do they buy things like Orca, you know, like Jito? Uh, I'm not sure, you know, like the DeFi ETH chart is, has been memed to death, right? Like DJ yeah. Martin saying make your ETH to zero, right? <laughs> uh, so it's like, it's like been over three years, or, the, the yeah, that, market is over. Yeah. And you know, I'm part of the mid curve, right? I'm like a maker bull. So, you know, I'm just like in the mid curve, but I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be the mid curve, right? I'm just like. You know, I mean, you said it best, right? Like I was left curve initially, right? Made a bunch of money, got lost a bunch of money. And now I'm like, yeah, like I'm a mid curve, <laughs> but I'm trying to respect the mid curve. You know, I represent 68% of the population and there's some value in that. Um, but, you know, I need to you know, steer left or right uh, in the future. Um, and I, I love how, you know, you mentioned, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here, but, you know. Cardano is a meme for those who want to hurt themselves. I mean, it's kind of a joke, um, but I, I feel like at the end of the day, people kind of get what they want from the markets, right? It's like, if you're gambling on memes, you're just, you're just having fun, right? And if you make much money, that's great. If you don't, then at least you get to laugh at, you know, does the dog still have a hat? Um, Cardano yeah. is actually a really interesting uh, case study. I don't know much about what's going on there because I, I never see developers building on Cardano. But I saw, I saw a very interesting data set recently which is the average holding time of various tokens, the top 10 tokens on Coinbase. And that, that, that data is, is public, by the way. You, you, can, you can log into Coinbase, go to the asset page, and see what's the average holding time of that token. And guess what? Cardano is ranked number one. 300-day holding time, average holding time for Cardano. And number two is uh, Solana. That's, it's around 200, 250. And number three is Bitcoin. And I was thinking to, I was, when I saw this data, I, I was saying to myself, this is the most objective measure of whether or not a community or a token is a cult, is a religion. And the Cardano turns out to be the biggest cult in crypto. And that's why their token has, like, despite nothing happening on, on Cardano, at least from my perspective, the token is trading at, like, ridiculously high valuation. Yeah, and... Obviously, I have like a YouTube channel, so I kind of have a good glimpse into the YouTube crypto community and like the Twitter community. And Cardano and XRP is huge on crypto YouTube, but people on CT don't like watch YouTubers because they think they're like mostly scammers, which or grifters, like you know, which I partially agree with. But um, but little follow up with the holding period, like does that take into is it because people aren't withdrawing Cardano because they don't there's like nothing to do, uh, so it's just like sitting in their wallets. Like, that, that is a so really good, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I don't know how exactly they calculate it, but what you mentioned, mentioned just there, the, right there is, uh, is a possible reason why the, the data is skewed. 
right? Because if you if you own Bitcoin, right, you can you can withdraw into your own hardware wallet, and people are pretty comfortable with it, with a hardware wallet. But I'm not sure how how much Cardano holders are educated when it comes to uh, cold storage and and doing stuff on chain. So so yeah, you could that that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I remember like Cardano smart contracts were super hyped, and then there was Sunday Swap. Uh, and I think they launched and it take it took like a seven week oh sorry seven days for your transactions to settle. Um, I I don't I don't mean to bash on the Cardano community, right? Like you know, uh, I have nothing against people, right? Um, but it's just kind of funny <laughs> how you said Cardano is for people that want to hurt themselves. Um, that's that's hilarious. It's a joke. That's really interesting though. That's really interesting how like because technically you can withdraw Solana and do stuff, but people I guess people still like to hold Solana on Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. Yeah, and I guess like these L1 tokens, they're all cults in some way. And let me just pull up this other tweet. The, the, by the way, the uh, the the the, uh, the the devil's advocate against Solana is that uh, Solana, the Solana holding time is like 350. Well, guess what? The Solana bear market also lasted that long. Like Solana was like flat below $20, 25, let's say, for like almost a year. So like all the, all the bag holders, didn't want to sell for 250 days. So that, that's, the, that's the devil's advocate against that number for Solana. Like, like, do you mean that there's a lot of, I guess, bag holder resistance of people yeah. that's trying to sell yeah, like, break even? You know, like, oh shit, my, my token is down 90%. Why, why would I sell now? Kind of sentiment. Yeah. I've heard a lot. Like, I mean, whenever I talk to crypto people, um, people are like, oh yeah, like I'm going to wait to sell until I'm break even. Um, I feel like that's a really bad mentality to have because you should just evaluate your portfolio every single day as it's as if it's like a new position. Um, what other types of well, I guess, well mental in a barriers? way, yes, but but the, the the flip side is if you're lucky to pick the right coin, let's say BTC from the early days or ETH from the early days or Solana in the last in this cycle, then the right thing to do is to backhold it, right? Because the the to the the price will eventually come back. Uh, but if you're unlucky to pick the or unskilled to pick the wrong token, then yeah, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't have back back held. Yeah, I mean that's easier said than done, right? Like, how do you pick the right coins to back hold versus you know like just you know get out of get out of there with a loss? Um, I know you had this tweet around how everything is a religion, um, and that's really bullish. Like Bitcoin now, either now Solana. Um, like, how do you kind of? <laughs> oh, and you also <laughs> kind of talked about the mid curve here too, but like. How do you kind of identify religions before their consensus, right? Because of course, right now everyone can say, oh yeah, Solana, like, you know, strong community, et cetera, bonk, whiff, et cetera. Um, but like three months ago, that was really hard to identify. Like, how do you spot these things before they happen? Um, in a way, uh, it does require someone to be in, in my seat to, to see that because I, I speak with the developers uh, day in day out so a year ago when Solana sort of when everyone claimed Solana died because of FTX I, I knew that was wrong because I saw firsthand that the Solana developers there there was there were a handful like maybe a, a critical mass of like 100 developers Solana developers that were crazy about Solana they were not leaving Solana and this is something that you probably can't see on Twitter or, or on YouTube so that's the, the sort of quote unquote insider information that I have, but I tweeted about it. Um, so you can see that kind of information from me. Um, so that's one, one thing you, you can, you can one, one piece of information you can tell uh, whether or not uh, an ecosystem is a religion. But something else you can, you, can, you, you, can, you can look at is like, you know, on Solana, you have people like Xerox Mert single-handedly taking on all the ETH maxis in every debate and ratioing Every single one of them, every single time. Like, and and Xerox Murdy is he's not a a paid shill or anything. He's he's a developer in the Solana ecosystem himself. He's building a a RPC for Solana, and yet he loves Solana so much that he would spend so much time day in day out to debate ETH maxis. That that is a sign of a religion for me. And I see yeah. something similar with the, the, the Tensor founders and, and the founders of, of Camino 
all, both of which are, are uh, Solana projects to a, lesser, to a lesser extent, of course. But you see signs of this um, and you see growing signs of this. BTC is, is, is basically taking this notion to the extreme, right? By definition, all the BTC maxis, they have nothing to do except for hodling, hodling and, and debating others on the internet. By the way, they blocked, they, I, I, I got blocked by all of them in, in the last cycle. In, no, in the 2017 cycle. That's I don't bullish. see them anymore. That, that's that's really, so bullish. really bullish. Because <laughs> every time I try to have a reasonable argument with them, I just get blocked. So they lived in their own bubble and, and their bubble grows. Um, so that, that's something, I can see this stuff on, on, uh, on Twitter. It's public information. Yeah. And even like Ansem too, right? Like Ansem's kind of like this main character and he was just like Bobo sing <laughs> Solana. And then, yeah. you know, as soon as things start pumping, he's like, oh, like I told you guys. And it's like this tribalism uh, starting all over again. Another element I want to add is in order for, I guess, ecosystem to form a strong community, like you have to make the, or, like, the early believers rich, right? Um, and I think the Jito airdrop did a lot um, where I know like one of the analysts that you know, worked for me, like he made like, I mean, I'm not going to say that. Like, yeah, he, he made like an insane amount. Like he just like staked Solana across like yeah. six wallets. Yeah. And he was like, what? what the, he, he was in disbelief, you know? Yeah. Um, and now there's like the Jupiter airdrop. People are speculating on the Tensor airdrop, Parcel airdrop, Margin Phi. There's so yeah. much things to look forward to that I think it's really hard to not be a pessimist on the Solana ecosystem. Uh, you have to make the early holders rich. And that's why I'm like super bullish, the airdrop narrative, the cycle. Um, it's like the easiest way to bootstrap a bootstrap community. Like, what do you think about that? When it comes to uh, making early adopters rich, uh, Solana is actually not the front runner for me because Solana, at the end of the day, their earliest uh, supporters were, in fact, uh, VCs and, and the, the big guys like FTX. Uh, the front runners for me is Bitcoin and Ethereum. By definition, Bitcoin was open to the public. Everyone could could have bought Bitcoin if they wanted to, and they made the BTC maxes really really rich. Ethereum, same thing. Back in 2014, there were 3,000 wallets that um, participated in the in the presale of Ethereum. Everyone could have participated. And I'm actually not aware of any VC that did. Uh, every VC mid-curved on, on Ethereum back in 2014. And so big, Ethereum made the, the early individual retail buyers also very, very rich. That's why you have Ethereum and Bitcoin as, as the two biggest religions in crypto. Solana for me is number three, by the way. Interesting. Um, and I just want to share this other tweet that you posted here. So like, like you mentioned earlier, um, you identified that other than, you know, Bitcoin and Ether, you've also identified Solana, Arbitrum Optimism, Polygon yep. Cosmos as the seven magnificent ecosystems. Uh, yeah. Is this because you just like, you, you have all these applicants uh, that you might want to invest in and most of them are building on these ecosystems? Is that kind of how you determine which ecosystems might be a winner in the next cycle? There's a, there's a quantitative uh, aspect of it, and there is a qualitative. By the way, this Mag Seven could have easily been nine. I just, I just like the word Mag, Mag Seven because that's what the boomers say about the Mag yeah, Seven yeah. stocks in the S and P five hundred. But if you scroll down to the bottom of this of thread, and you 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 click on this this data, uh, right here, yeah, uh, you can uh, open the third one, the third screenshot. So you can see very easily from this, uh, this is our app, the, the, the startups applying to Alliance over the last three years. And uh, Ethereum is, is by far number one plus Polygon. By the way, Polygon, Polygon is another very interesting uh, case study because everyone hates on Polygon now. <laughs> but Yeah, it's, it's, like it's like the common thing to do on Twitter, right? It's like the popular thing to do. It's like, oh yeah, like Polygon sucks. That's but right. this is interesting. Polygon has the second largest ecosystem of developers, at least startup founders. Solana is number three. And Solana is making a V-shaped recovery since... But if, if you look at the Solana part, uh, it bottomed in uh, H2 2022. Well, guess what? what? What else happened in H2 2022? Mm, yeah. FTX collapsed in H2 2022. But it's making a V-shaped recovery now. 
So those are top three. But then uh, within Ethereum, uh, you have Arbitrum and Optimism. Uh, both are both are doing really well. Um, they're like number three and four. Uh, I would consider Bayes as part of Optimism for now. You can argue that it's separate. Uh, but th the reason why I didn't include Bayes in the original Mac 7 is because they're new. Uh, they launched like maybe half a year ago. Close to a year ago, maybe. And so they, they need to prove that they're Lindy. That, that's the only reason why I didn't uh, put Bayes there. But I'm very bullish Bayes uh, for the next cycle. Uh, yeah, and... Bitcoin is the one that will catch everyone off guard, I think. Bitcoin is actually growing and it like everyone in for me the the VC crowd and, and the the West um these two crowds are underestimating uh Bitcoin. Um but there is a growing number of developers building on Bitcoin thanks to ordinals, BRC twenties and other protocols like this making uh Bitcoin more uh interesting. And there's a, a growing uh, a number of startups building Bitcoin layer twos. That's an, another topic, very interesting topic in its own. Uh, Bitcoin is going to catch everyone off guard, I think. It's really interesting. And then the last yeah. one is Cosmos. Cosmos, you don't see it. You don't really see it on, on this um, chart. And primarily that's because um, Cosmos developers are... A lot of them are middle layer, you know, infrastructure projects that don't need an accelerator like us. They just raise a shit ton of money from VCs and they just go for it. That, that's why you don't see it here. But you know, if if you think about the the, the recent projects that, that everyone is talking about, you know, say um, Celestia, all these projects, they're built on um, the Cosmos SDK. So yeah, so these are the Max Seven. Yeah, that's interesting. Like the Bitcoin stuff is interesting. Like I've seen some videos on Twitter where there's like these Chinese grand grandmas like trying to figure out how to mint VRC twenties. Um, and I feel, I feel like this is one phenomenon that I notice on CT is that I think most of a CT activity is amongst I guess like like white men, like like Americans and like Europeans. CT is then, very US centric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So like. They don't really know what's happening in other ecosystem like in Asia. Like, do you think uh, this is like? I'm just curious. But like, with Polygon, like, are these mostly like developers from India that's applying to you, or Poly is there Polygon like more has to... a lot of has a big community in, in India? But I don't think Polygon is is restricted to to India. Um, I think they're all over the the world. Um, I think Polygon just ha has a pretty bad PR right now, but. I can almost guarantee the moment that they change their ticker from Matic to Paul, P-O-L, the price will go up. That, that's, that's what the 70 IQ in me thinks. Really? Um, really? <laughs> because the, the chart right now really sucks. If you look at it, um, it, it doesn't go up and the narrative sucks. But uh, the, the rebrand, I, I bet it'll change everything. Uh, the, yeah. Because after a rebrand, uh, the 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 price chart on on exchanges and on trading view they'll they'll, they'll restart the reboot from zero so it'll print a nice chart hopefully yeah um, no like when, when you were saying that I kind of got reminded of like this do you know Beam it's like this gaming subnet chain it's like yeah. they were Merit Circle and the, the price was like a hundred million val and then they rebranded with like a new token with smaller uh, unit bias and like ten x <laughs> like what like what is going on here like it, I, I guess like unit bias and th this is like the mid curve take, right? It's like unit bias doesn't matter. Like, you know, it's like, it's all about market cap, like pick, like how the chart looks doesn't matter. But I guess like the 70 IQ says that, well, like there's like no resistance. It's only up from here. And then if you're like 150 IQ, you're like, well, if that's our retail things, then I need to front run them. Uh, <laughs> is, is that is that kind of like the definition of, or maybe, maybe like not the de definition, but like the epitome of like the first cycle and the third cycler is like this, you know, you, you just like don't want to be in the mid curve, right? Like just, just, just don't do it. Yeah. The, the unit bias hundred percent applies. Um, and, um, 
the price chart, reprinting the price chart from scratch, that 100% applies. So yeah, both both are uh, the, the 70 IQ uh, phenomenon. Okay, okay, yeah. This this is good to know, you know, because um, I'm sure that most of my viewers, because um, I started this channel in, I think, Q3 of 2020. So I think most of my audience are, you know, second or third cyclers, uh, maybe some, you know, some first cyclers, but I think the most of them reside in this mid curve, like myself. Um, do you have any advice for them? I mean, we, we've already kind of talked about them, but if they want to, you know, take your knowledge and be in, in the right curve, um, like what kind well, of, way, I, I guess. I personally mid curve a lot. Like I, I, I actually tweeted about this. Most people, most of the time mid curve and, and that includes myself. I, I just tried really hard to get out of it. And I think there, there, there are two ways to get out of it. Um, one is, uh, I, I tweeted about this, one is you, 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 read, you read what people say on Twitter that, and you don't want to read everyone's stuff. You want to read the, the people who are intelligent and controversial. They're not afraid to piss off a lot of people because, because on Twitter, there's a lot of politics. There, there, oftentimes, you, you're, you can't say, there are certain things you cannot say, but you want to follow the people who who make reasonable arguments about their views and are not afraid to be controversial and contrarian. Uh, because you can learn a lot from them. You can learn the truth from them. What you don't want to do is read the stuff that just sounds, that, that's really abstract, incomprehensible. Uh, a lot of VCs do that, by the way. A lot of VCs say things that sound okay, that sound smart, but if you, think more critically about it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you, you don't want to listen to that. You don't want to read that stuff. You want to, that, that really is fast food. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's fast food for me. It's junk food mm. for, for, my, for my brain. So that's one thing you can do. Listen to, 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 to the people who are controversial and, and, and smart um, and, and concrete. They, they say concrete things. The other way is to risk enough of your own money to participate in those products, whether it's Jupiter or Tensor, or more recently Say or whatever, just try the products and risk enough of your own money that if you lose, if you lose it, it's gonna hurt. It's not it's because the only way for you to to learn a lesson is for you to get hurt. Or Frantech, Frantech is another example. Um, I, I know this because I actually I know a lot of people um, tried Frantech. But they only tried it for like five minutes, spent five minutes on it, and started like forming opinions on it. Uh, I think it's a really bad way. You want to use 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 products for for um, long enough of a of a time period to really develop insights to to understand the products intuitively. In other yeah. words, be a DGen. Yeah, so these are the two ways. Yeah, I think you had a piece on this, right? So it's like. People should learn from the DGENs because that's how you determine whether something will get usage or not. Uh, you, you have to be an early user. Um, and I also think that, you know, w w the, the topic around politics, um, it got kind of got me thinking of like the whole ETH alignment, like discussion. It's like, like no one actually cares, right? Just like, I got, or like what, what do you think about like this whole ETH alignment thing or like the politics around the ETH ecosystem? Um, because I, you know, you also had this, uh, tweet around, I guess, my gift or your gift to the ETH community around the lack of a strong narrative. Um, and we don't have to read through all this, but maybe we can focus on the very yeah. top part. Yeah, I can summarize the original motivation. I, I think for a very long time, and I call this the ETH marketing department, a lot of people don't like this, but it's really the ETH marketing department, quote unquote, because obviously they don't have a real centralized department. It's more like the influencers of, of CT, right? But for a very long time, I noticed that the youth marketing department um, sends messages that are too technocratic, technocratic, too confusing, too ivory tower-ish. It's, it's really painful. It's really painful for the, the intended audience. Um, it's not that they don't have a. It's not that they have too many narratives. It's that they're not targeting the, the right audience and send them the right message. So if all you talk about on Twitter, is, technical jargons like, 
4844, restaking, blah, 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 all these things that the average, the average person doesn't understand, then you're going to only appeal to the people who, who like this kind of stuff. And these are, um, let's say, protocol developers, philosophers, etc. That's fine, by the way. But what you really want to target as the Ethereum marketing department is the developers, or in this case, as I mentioned, the institutions. So what I'm trying to say is, you want, if I were them, I would try to devise a clear message for each of these segments and not confuse them. So specifically, for this particular post, if the goal is to make price go up for the ETH token, then what they should be targeting is the institutions. And why is that? Because ETH has four very durable and unreplicable advantages right now. And these are number one, Ethereum is the most lindy smart contract chain. Number two, it's the only smart contract chain that crossed the regulatory chasm. For example, they have a CME futures, right? And a related futures ETF. And the SEC is comfortable with that. And number three, they're aligned with Coinbase. And number four, they have a yield ever since the last two upgrades. All these four durable advantages lead to the same path, which is that Ethereum is the most institution-friendly chain. And it's, it's a set of advantages that, that no other smart contracts have, no, no other smart contract chains have, including Solana, Avalanche, blah, 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 blah. And my point is the Ethereum community really needs to focus on their own durable advantages. Because come in May, the ETH ETF will get approved. But just because you get the ETF approved doesn't mean people will buy it. You want to give people a reason to buy it. And you want to give the institutions these four reasons to buy it. So it's just something there. Uh, I mean, first of all, you know, maybe, you know, the, the bankless guys can be taking notes now right now, but you mentioned that you think the ETH ETF is going to be approved in May. Like what confidence interval would you give that? I, I know Larry Hing was talking about it on TV and stuff, yeah. but yeah. Well, the, the confidence is, uh, well, so let's start with the, the devil's advocate. Devil's advocate is that Gary Gensler is going to fight tooth and nail against it. Um, but he'll need a really good reason to uh, deny the ETF, but he doesn't have one because ETH is in the exact same um, situation as, as BTC when it comes to having a futures-based ETF. And they went to the court for this when it, when it comes to uh, BTC. The court basically said that the SEC didn't have a good reason to deny the BTC ETF because the futures ETF existed. You, you cannot you know, create double standards uh, for, for, for the futures ETF and the spot ETF. And, and Ethereum is in the same um, spot as BTC on that front. And the second thing, which gives me really good, really high conviction, much higher than the first one, actually, is that Larry Fink is, is pumping it. And Larry Fink, Larry Fink failed once in the last like 500 or something, 300, 500, I can't remember the, the exact number, ETF applications. So you don't want to bet against that track record. By the way, Larry Fink is the marketing department for Ethereum as of today. That's a good point. He's going to unpump it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like I, when you said that, I thought of, I thought of this board art meme. <laughs> it's, it's just like, now, right now, it's our, it's our Fonzie now, you know, like time to pump it. Give us all the fees. <laughs> is, is this your bull case for ETH? Yes. What do you think? That, that is exactly my bull case for ETH. And going back to um, yeah, this post here, I, I guess not buying into this ETH ETF narrative is, is like a mid curve. It's like, oh, like it's not like it, it'll be sold in you. Someone wants to buy it. But then if you're a first cycler or or a third cycler, you're like, well, like Larry Fink's going to pump it. <laughs> is that how yeah, you're first cycler is it? Larry Fink's going to pump it. And third cycler is, yeah, Larry Fink has a great track record. You don't want to bet against it. And then second cycler is sell the news. Sell the news or no way they're going to. 
I, I don't even know what argument they have now against the ETH ETF. I don't, I don't see a really sound argument. I'm not saying ETH ETF has 100% likelihood of getting approved. There's always a, a, a likelihood of getting denial. But I, don't, I just don't see a good, really good argument. Yeah, I agree. I think they're just sidelined. The, the <laughs> people who are bearish ETH now are just sidelined. You think there's this coping? You think ETH BTC is bottoms? Uh, I, I th pretty, I'm pretty confident it has bottomed uh, two days ago. By the way, I, I was too early on this. I was saying ETH, ETH BTC bottomed like a month ago. Uh, and it went down a little bit more. But in the grand scheme of things, I, I would just err too early a little bit. Yeah, this, ETH, look at this candle. Look at this. That's a that's a green deal though if I've ever seen one. That's a that, that's the god candle that people <laughs> Yeah, this is crazy. Twenty one percent. I don't even remember the last time we had I guess in July of last year we had like fifteen percent candle, but yeah, this is this is a market clearly telling the market that hey, like it's bullish, right? Like sometimes you just have to listen to the markets. The um, market showing its hands. It's it's tipping its hands. It's always tipping its hands. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's hilarious um we're like roughly 40 minutes in here um i do want to talk about some audience questions and some rep card questions um so I, I guess just for some background obviously alliance you would invest in earlier like early stage companies right uh, do you do any liquid market stuff or is that more for nope. your personal book okay i, I only do liquid for, from my personal money okay got it then i guess i'll answer so I'll ask you a question more from like the investment side with like like a decent time horizon. But what are some common traits of su successful investors? I mean, this is your fourth cycle. Um, you're trying to get out of mid curve, right? You're 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 somewhat trapped in the mid curve, right? But you're trying to you know you're trying to get out. Um, like out of all the successful people that you've encountered, uh, what are some common traits that you uh, see in them that you want to learn from? I never thought about this deeply um, because. I feel like they, there's more differences between them than, than commonalities. Um, I think to succeed in the market, different types of people, different strategies, different types of people can, can succeed. So for example, on, on Twitter, you see a, a lot of these rotators, right? That rotate every two months. They're short-term traders. They understand the narrative, the short-term narrative really, really well. They're degens. They can succeed. And then you have the long-term investors who, who can see where the market is or the industry is going in two to five years, that takes a completely different skill uh, in the liquid market. But then you also have the, the venture investors um, and, and the ones that are successful tend to also have really strong network. It, like venture investing is more of a net, network-based investing, right? So there's, there's different strategies and every, every one of them requires different skill sets. But I think... Um, if I had to pick one thing, all of them are pretty good at math. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess it's like critical thinking and I, I guess like more rational, you think? Um, of course. Yeah. Rational and, and uh, not sentiment, uh, not driven by their own sentiment. Um, and, and by the way, this, this is something I want to touch on more. Because I, I tweeted about this, but I, I do think that most people on Twitter, at least, spend too much time doing short-term trading, whether it's rotation or you know, selling the, the news or looking at the RSI or the funding rates. It's really not a good game for most people. I, 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 would, be, I, I would really strongly advise against that because you operate in a market that has 10x to go in which you can probably find some 100x's, potentially even 1,000x's. and why would you want to do this short-term trading? You have probably very little edge in the short-term stuff. Um, I'm, so I'm going to sound like a broken record now, but I, I would try to be more like Warren Buffett than, let's say, Stanley Druckenmiller, at least in crypto, for most people. I think trying to become Warren Buffett is, is a better strategy for most. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons for that is because a lot of Twitter posts are driven by, I guess, traders, because traders just have different thoughts all the time. Um, and I guess they're incentivized to, I guess, 
you know, get other people to buy after them or something. <laughs> um, so they're, they're like always tweeting, right? They're like tweeting 10 times a day about a yeah. ticker. Whereas investors, they're just like in their own lane flourishing, um, you know, in like a hot tub or something. Um, yeah, but like, I, I definitely agree. Like don't, I, I guess advice is like, just because you see something on social media doesn't mean that it's like truth, right? Uh, it's kind of like how Eat Maxis, I guess, uh, their their marketing department, they're saying all these things, but it doesn't mean that it's actually true. Um, in fact, there's things that they can improve on. Maybe they should be focusing on like the institutional friendly chain as like what you said. Um, is that kind of how you think about it? By the way, what, what I said there is is not the objective truth. It's just something that I think could work really well for, for ETH. And I, a lot of them disagree with me and that's fine. But I think I'll be proving right in, in three months. All right, um, all right. Because, because everyone's, ETF, gonna, right? everyone's gonna talk about the ETF. And and anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a separate topic. Back to your original question. Um, yes, social media is just, Twitter, Twitter is too noisy. Uh, I don't actually use Twitter as a source of um, insights and alpha. I use it more as a gauge of sentiment. Uh, if everyone is too bullish, maybe it's time to take some money off the table. If everyone is bearish, I, by the way, I, I did this with Solana a year ago. Everyone was bearish Solana a year ago when F FTS collapsed. Um, I actually didn't, at that time, I didn't know that people were, I, I didn't associate FTX with Solana, to be honest, but I, I saw a lot of people talking about FTX was the reason why Solana would die. and. I knew that that was false. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I use Twitter as a sentiment gauge. I see. Yeah. I, I also, I mean, I, I mid curved the Solana trade. I mean, I actually went to a hackathon for Solana and I met a bunch of teams and it was very vibrant. Uh, you know, like there's a bunch of people there. I was like, oh, like this is pretty bullish. And then my mid curve inside me was like, well, like the FTX indicate like liquidators are going to sell this much. So like I can probably buy Solana in like a couple months. And then, yeah. like, that was my mentality. It was like four or five X. Oh, uh, so. this mentality, by the way, a lot of people have this mentality. And again, this ties back to the, to my original point about being more like Warren Buffett than Stanley Druckenmiller is that in the bear market, which probably is over, but for your, for your next cycle in the bear market, you're going to have maybe a year, six months to a year to really accumulate at, at the bottom. The, because the, the price action will be flat for six to 12 months. And you don't want to wait for the pickle bottom. You're never going to ca catch it. What you want to do is probably DCA into um, you know, a, a token that you're really bullish on for like, let's say six months and be done with it. Because when the market comes back, it'll come back really violently, which was the case for Solana. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess it's, you know, DCA or, you know, things like that. It's not really sexy, right? As like a thing to talk about. People just want to talk about 10x longing the bottom and making all this, all this money. Uh, but it's, it's too hard to do. It's just like way too hard. Um, like you, you mentioned, you know, to have this Warren Buffett mentality of just, you know, just finding things that you believe in and just just believe, right? Just be a left <laughs> for left curve, right curve. Just like believe in something. Like, what are some characteristics of, I guess, a hundred x trades? Um, because obviously the the industry is much bigger now. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's going to be diminishing like gains, I guess, to the upside, but also diminishing uh, re returns like to the downside. Yeah. Uh, what type of sector should people be looking into if they really want to get those outsized gains in the in the in the in the liquid markets? That's a really hard question. I I don't think you can find 100Xs in the majors anymore. Majors are maybe 10Xs from here. By majors, I mean, let, let's say the top 20 to 30 tokens. So you have to look much beyond that. I don't try to, so personally, I don't try to catch 100Xs anymore because I've already caught 2,000X, 10,000. I, I caught 1,000X and 1,000X. I'm, 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 I'm bad. <laughs> I'm, for the long tail of assets, I'm just trying to have some fun and not YOLO anymore. So I cannot give you good advice on this, unfortunately. The, the, the one, to this is not financial advice, but the, the one token I, I think I probably will get 100x this cycle is uh, WIF. That, that's the only token I'm paying attention to in, in the long tail. 
in the long tail of assets. Interesting. I also remember you like Toshi, like the 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 cat coin. I, I think I on really Facebook. regret. I really regret saying that on, on in the past. I really regret it because I, I wasn't even high conviction. I just I don't know why I said that, but on base, uh, bald could have been it. <laughs> I know. Rugged. They're rugged. Bald is is the best meme on, on base. So it, it's really unfortunate. Yeah. It really had all the characteristics of a good coin, right? Just Brian Armstrong, Jeremy Allaire. You know, it's like the, the Tradify chain. Like, they're all bald. Like, you know, just bide bald. Yeah. But no, like, the founder rugged. It is what it is. That's that's crypto. <laughs> that's crypto. Um, I guess, like, what are some... I mean, aside from mid curving, right? Uh, and we talked about that, but like, what are some other common mistakes uh, people make, right? So like maybe some big miscon misconceptions people have about the crypto markets uh, that I guess are detrimental to people's success. Can we pick a persona? Because there, there's different personas. For example, yeah, institutions, yeah, yeah. they make mistakes because they're so, they're, they're still thinking their cash flow PE type of mentality. They're just going to make her of everything. By the way, when when, this, when institutions come into this space, there's no way they're gonna outperform us in, in a PVP setting. No way. They're just gonna make her for five years until their third, the third cycle. Um, for retail, again, I, I think the biggest mistake is is short term trading. They have no most most ninety five percent retail have zero edge in short term trading. Yeah, it's. Um, it's like those things where I think statistically 90% of traders lose, but if you get 100 traders in a room and you ask them if they're winning traders, they're all going to raise their hands, right? It's like one of those things where you have to be self-aware. Um, and you know, if you have an edge, then you should push it. But most people's edge is just holding, right? Um, and not being shaken out. And then maybe make some contrarian bets here and there. Uh, how, how important do you think is contrarianism? Um, like Solana, for example, was good to write, but Sometimes you want to be with the crowd. Sometimes you don't want to be with the crowd. Like, how, how do you think about it? If you're a short-term trader, you want to be with the crowd. If you're a long-term investor, you want to go against the crowd. The, the, because the, the market typically operates this way. The short-term, it's momentum-driven. Long-term, is mean reverting. In, in crypto at least. Uh, stocks is a different story. Um, short-term, you know, every, if everyone pumps something, but if you really want to be a short-term trader, you just follow the the big influencers like Hasaka and some of these guys. They start pumping. Yeah, you just stop thinking. Just YOLO. Uh, YOLO and uh, ape, ape him first, research later. If you, by the way, I'm, I'm not <laughs> I'm not recommending this, but if, if you had to do this, uh, you follow these guys. Um, but long-term investors um, just assimilate the information, digest the information over a long period of time, and at some point, you will, you'll be pretty good at it. And you need to be contrarian. Yeah, I, I think like one type of contrarian bet, and this is like what I also agree with you on, is like RWAs. Um, I mean, payment's cool too. Um, I think Blackbird, I don't know if you've ever tried Blackbird, but I think they're, they could be like a good bet on potentially like overtaking Square. Um, but like, the two biggest non-consensus verticals you're excited for are these two. Um, can you kind of expand on why you think they're non-consensus and what make like what you know, why you think that they're going to be like such I guess good trades or investments moving forward? I think they're just boring. Like payment RWS, they're just not sexy. Payment like it's not speculative. It's just pay with USDC for something, right? It's so boring. Uh, RWS, RWS. At least on a narrative point of view, it's getting some traction, but a lot of crypto purists are very much against RWS. They're like, you know, these are not true crypto innovation. We want a true crypto native, blah, 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 right? Like there, there's always skepticism against these two. So they're, 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 not they're not consensus. But the data is so compelling. So in 2022, uh, I think $14 trillion worth of stable coins settled on chain. And that dwarfed pay PayPal, for example, by a factor of like six to seven. And that number also surpassed Visa by a little bit in 2022. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy how, how much payment has, has gotten adopted 
And one of the reasons why it's still contrarian is because, again, CT is very much a US-centric um, environment. And most people in the US don't appreciate how big of a deal stable coins are for the global South. Um, Stablecoin is a global South uh, phenomenon, and speculation is a first world problem. Everyone on CT talks about speculation, but payment is really uh, something that, that they don't talk about and, and really taking place in the global South. Yeah, I guess you can only speculate when your own currency is stable, right? So stable coins provide a really strong use case for, I mean, for example, like I think over half of USDT is on Tron. And I was actually looking at TRX and it's, it's deflationary, you know, TRX is more deflationary than ETH because part of the transaction fees gets burned. Um, and I also read this, uh, Brevin Howard, uh, their report on stable coins and yeah, I mean, I, I think RWAs is like a bet on, I guess, yield bearing dollars as I like as I like to call it, just taking more market share from non-yield bearing dollars, like just USDC and Tether. Of course, USDC and Tether, like, you know, Circle is going to IPO sometime soon. So I'm sure they're going to be worth a decent chunk. Um, but yeah, I, I still really like the RWA space. Last thing I want to ask as we wrap up here is, you know, if you could go back in time, uh, let's say to your first cycle, um, or if, you know, five, like however long you want to go back in time, mm -hmm. do you have any... Like advice you want to give your younger self? You know, I just got really lucky. I, I think I, I've done, I've played my my cards really well. But if I could have done one thing was to quit TradFi much, much, much earlier and just go straight into crypto and, and build something 10 years ago. Um, I, I, I didn't have that high of a risk appetite 10 years ago. Um, I needed a fairly lucrative TradFi job in order to fund my crypto speculation. That worked out pretty well, but if I knew that crypto was going to get this big, I probably would have jumped a long time ago. Yeah. I know a lot of people that's, that, that tells me, hey, I, I want to go full time, but I'm kind of scared. Like what, like what, what do you recommend these people, right? Like people that want to take the jump, but they're still kind of skittish. Uh, is there anything that I guess they can tell themselves or... You know, point at and have that be a reason to just go deeper into the rabbit hole um, or does it just take time? It takes time and the fact that there the fact that so many people are still st skeptical about this industry tells me that it's still early. TM. Oh, bullish. <laughs> Wag me. <laughs> You're so early. <laughs> Larry, Larry Fink. Larry Fink is still coming in, you know. it's it's He's going to make it his Ponzi. <laughs> <laughs> that's so bullish all right um yeah i, I think that's gonna be it like uh well thank you thank, thank you for taking the time uh, i really enjoyed this chat uh thank where you, can people find you uh you can find me on twitter qwqiao awesome well i hope you guys enjoyed episode 11 of the market wizards and i'll see you guys later bye-bye take care